1958, from that time onward, I knew him, and I have special love and regard for him, because he's, he helped me to indirectly to become the monk. My brother was my, I had to take care of my brother who was going to college. And he was the head of a big re educational institution. He took my brother in his institution so that I can join very quickly in the monastic order. <laughs> so he does not know perhaps, but I am very grateful to him that he was very kind to me. And I am extremely happy that he is with us. I wanted him on a Sunday, but, um, but his uh, schedule is so tight that we had to fight with the nun in Santa Barbara to get him here for two days, two nights. <laughs> because he is traveling almost all the centers of the order and other places also. So anyhow, tonight Swami will speak about his memories of the direct disciples, and tomorrow he will give a lecture. So please come tomorrow, and we shall be very happy that Swami will be with us. Swami Chetunananda Ji and friends, let me say how happy I am to be able to come to this center, even though not for as long a stay as I would have liked, or you would have liked, or from the Chitananda you would have liked. You see, I've been traveling uh, quite a bit. Uh, I've been away from my place of work now more than two months. And uh, two months uh, is a long time seeing that uh, that is a very large institution and we do not have too many monastic workers there, not at least many senior monastic workers. And I sometimes feel guilty in my mind about being absent for so long a time. <coughs> That's why I had to uh, schedule my tour in a way that uh, I would be everywhere, I mean in every center of our mission in the United States of America, but only briefly. <coughs> now to come to my personal reminiscences of those great souls, I mean the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. It has been my privilege to meet some of them, live with them, and also serve them. You know, when I was uh, just entering college. I'd finished my school. I was about to enter college. I started visiting Belwood Mott. I saw those great souls. But to be frank, I did not understand many of them. Not that I understand them even now, no. Only when I became a monk myself and understood what being a monk really meant, I began to realize that it has been my great good fortune to have known them. Small incidents, a few casual words, Sometimes a touch, a physical touch, the looks, all these now bear a meaning 
which I never suspected they had. They inspired me as I look back. I think of them walking along their, let us say, a very loving look. Sometimes you know a man's look still more than what he may actually say. He looks at you, you know at once. There's love and affection behind the look. Maybe he's not saying anything. The look is more eloquent than anything that he might have said in words. So that is what happened. I'm reminded of a, of a, of a day when we are celebrating Sri Ramakrishna's birthday at Belur Mot, long, long ago. I was still a student. I used to come to Belur Mot almost every Sunday. And also on special days, the days when some sort of celebration was going on. Could you tell us which year, Maharaj? I'll come to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember a group of musicians, perhaps you are familiar with the Bengali word Baul, Baul. Literally, it means vagabonds. They belong nowhere. You see, this Baul, they're wonderful people. You might say they are like paramanshas. They observe no caste rules. Well, they're free uh, from everything. Now, these Bauls, strangers, all of them, had come. No one had invited them. They had come on their own. They're going around the mort grounds. If you have been to Balloon Mort, you have some idea about the size of the mort grounds. This was before the big temple was built. We had a larger courtyard then. And they're going around, some, a dozen of them, singing and dancing. I still remember the, the part part of the sound. They named all the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, the monastic disciples, one after another. They said, if they had come separately, each one of them would have been regarded by the world as an avatara. Because they came together, we do not know how great each one of them was. There was Sri Ramakrishna, the son. And because Sri Ramakrishna was the son and they were his satellites, they are around him, naturally, we do not recognize their greatness. Though, if they had come separately, we would have felt that they were as great as an avatar. So I must say that was indeed a wonderful uh, assessment that these people, bowels, mostly uneducated, were made about the greatness of the titled disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. Now to tell you how I came to Belud Mot, how it happened that I came to be acquainted with this great Ramakrishna movement, even as a small boy. You see, I had a relation who used to work in the railways. My uncle, father's younger brother, you know, we had a joint family. And next to father was my uncle. And he himself had at one time tried to join the mission, but did not succeed because his mother opposed it very much. And his son, but that is my cousin, is now a monk and he is now head of that center at mother's place, Jairambati. 
Prem Ruparanda, that is his name. Now, my uncle had come home. I had just finished my annual examination. I had a long vacation. He said, why don't you come with me? You have a vacation? Come with me, let us go. So I said, yes, it's a good idea. I had more than a month uh, at my disposal to go wherever I wanted to go, so I accompanied him. And when I was there, the school to which my uncle's son, my cousin, Swami Premurupananda, who is now head of Jarambati, as I have just told you, a small boy, he is much younger than I am, said, will you care to have a look at our school? I said, yes, let me go. So we went together, and as we entered the school building, someone from one of the classrooms called out to him, and he immediately entered that classroom, and I also followed suit. And as we entered, we were soon followed by a teacher. And because the teacher had entered, we just sat down. We thought it would be bad manners if we went out immediately. So we just sat down. And that teacher turned to me and asked who I was and where I was from and so on, naturally a stranger in the class. And I told him who I was. It so happened that teacher was the headmaster of the school. I didn't know. And uh, it so happened also the class room which we had entered was the classroom of the class to which I had just been promoted. That was the last year of the school. But I was a student of another school, far away from this school I'm talking about. And I liked the headmaster very much, very much. But I didn't know that he liked me too. <laughs> I didn't know then. And after the class, I, well, I was very impressed by what he was teaching, the way he was teaching, everything impressed me very much. And after the class was over, we left the room, we went out, we had not yet seen, I had not yet seen the school building. We were going round, and again, we met the headmaster as we were going down. He said, why don't you come and join this school? I was taken aback. When he said this, I said, I have to consult my parents. I have to ask them, ask them, I would like you to come and read here. Then it so happened that I was enjoying a scholarship in my school because I was the best boy in the class. And the rule in that school was that the best boy in the class would always enjoy a scholarship. So I said, look, I enjoy a scholarship. He said, yes, we can give you a scholarship, but you have to justify it. We would like to test you, and if you turn out to be a good student, then we will certainly be glad to give you a scholarship. Will you come with me? I will test you right away. <laughs> so I he took me to his office, he asked me to write an essay on newspapers. <laughs> and I wrote one. And he said, come on Monday. That was a Saturday. And on Monday, well, I went back to my uncle. Before I narrated what uh, had happened, my cousin, Premurupananda, narrated everything to my uncle and my uncle said it wasn't fair on your part to have said yes i will come if i get a scholarship 
you are the best boy in that uh, school. In fact, they thought very highly of me, though I don't think that was justified. There was any reason for them to think so highly of me. But because I had been reading in that school over the years, they naturally wanted that I should stay on to complete the whole school program there. This was the last year of the school program. And uh, my uncle said, you should uh, not have made any promise. I said, what is the harm? This is a good school too, and I like the headmaster very much. So I went back to school on Monday, and the headmaster said, we will grant you a scholarship, but come and join, start attending classes right away. And in the, you know, usually there is an, uh, there is uh, a break in the middle of the day when students uh, have uh, half an hour's time to rest, to buy things, eat, and so on. In that break period, the headmaster sent for me, took me to his home, and asked me to open my, remove my shirt. He wanted to have a look at me. I come from uh, a Brahmin family, and he asked me if I, he himself was a Brahmin too, and if I practiced the Gita, I mean the Gayatri, if I recited the Gayatri every day and fasted and meditated and so on, if I knew anything about Ramakrishna, I said a little bit, I didn't know much. And that is how it started. Every day he would take me to his quarters and he would make me read the gospel of Ramakrishna. And he had a small shrine, and he would make me meditate there. He happened to be mother's disciple. His wife also was mother's disciple. His mother was also mother's disciple. And his uncle, he had two uncles in the mission, both monks. One was Swami Bibidi Shananda. Another was Swami Atma Bodhananda, who was Bibidi Shananda's elder brother. And his cousin was Swami Akhilananda. So he who tell me, look, you don't have to be a scholar. It doesn't matter. That is not very important. Be a monk. He would say, be a monk. Again and again he would say, I would like to see you a monk. And I said, yes, I will be a monk. And his wife would protest. His wife would say, what right have you got to ask another man's son to be a monk? He comes here to study. You should encourage him to study. Instead of encouraging him to study, you are asking him to be a monk. What right have you got to do that? Why don't you ask your son to be a monk? <laughs> he said, well, that would be very good indeed. I would be proud if my son became a monk someday. I'd be proud. That would annoy his wife all the more, and she would say, why don't you yourself be a monk? <laughs> <laughs> and he would say, oh, how I wish I could do that. <laughs> So <clears throat> that is how, you know, he began to inspire me. He asked me once, can you meditate the whole night without sleeping? I said, I'll try. And I did. And he was very happy. He was like that. And when I finished my school course, he said, go to Belun Mod immediately. He wrote a letter of introduction addressed to his uncle, Swami Atma Bodhananda. He did not know that Swami Atma, Bandhu, Swami Atma Bodhananda was not at Belun Mod, then he was at Mayavati. He didn't know. But he wrote a letter. I don't know what uh, he wrote. It was uh, sealed, so I didn't open it. 
and I had come to Calcutta and I wanted to go to Belwood Mott but I had never been there and I asked many people and no one knew where Belwood Mott was everybody said yes we have heard of the place but we do not know where it is one or two said well it is across the Hooghly you have to cross the river on the other side of uh, the river so I took a bicycle I was barely 16 then and odd months I took a bicycle I started I was in uh, the southernmost part of Calcutta southernmost part and uh, I rode all the way to Belvedere every few steps I would get off the bicycle ask a policeman or ask a passerby could you tell me where is Belvedere Mort and he would give me some direction but he himself was not very sure and that made no impression on my mind but finally I did get to Beirut Mott. It was half past three in the afternoon and the temples were just opening. I entered, there was nobody there. Only one monk was there and I said, uh, where is the shrine? He said, go this way. You have to climb up the steps. It is on the first floor. You know, the temple had not then come into being that was the old shrine it was on the first floor of an old building as I was climbing Swami Sivananda who lived just opposite the shrine he was on the first floor he opened the window of his room he saw me you know as I look back I feel he was waiting for me as if he was waiting to welcome me he knew I was coming there's no reason why he himself should open the window he had a tendency might have asked somebody open the window but he did open it and opened it and saw me and began to laugh hello where are you from who are you very happy I didn't know what to say. At once two attendants came running to me. They took me to him. And he repeated the same question. And when I said that I had just finished my school course, he wouldn't believe it. And he wouldn't even believe it that I had come all the way on a bicycle. <laughs> Look, this boy, barely 16, he has finished his school course. Or well, maybe I looked sh much shorter than I should have given my age. But some or other, he thought uh, it incredible that I should have finished my school course at that age. And that I had come all the way on a bicycle from that far off place, Khidirpur, as it is known. And he was very kind. And that is how it started and all the senior monks began to love me in fact I as I look back I feel they spoiled me in a way you know they made me think very highly of myself <laughs> all of them were very kind to me and one day Swami Atma Bodhananda my teachers Matan and uncle had by then come down to Belun Mod and a few others took me to Mahapurush Maharaj. Of course, I used to go to him whenever I visited Belur Mott, and I visited it every Sunday. And they said, Maharaj, this, he's a very nice boy, but he hasn't had any initiation yet. Will you please initiate him? And I began to weep. You know, why I began to weep, I don't know, I began to weep. And he was very pleased, said, yes, Baba. Baba means father, but the, you sometimes address your own child as Baba. Yes, Baba, certainly, right away I will give you my you initiation. Well, I don't care for formalities. So he started giving me the mantra, and the monks who had 
inter come to introduce me to him, ran away. And he initiated me then and there. You see, that is how it happened, my initiation. <laughs> Incidentally, long after this, a friend of mine approached me. He said, I would like to have initiation. I hear you have had initiation. My school friend, could you introduce me to Mahapurush Maharaj, Swami Sivananda? So I took him to Mahapurush Maharaj. I recommended, I said, Maharaj, please initiate me, a friend of mine. He said, yes, I will. But what mantra did I give you? I was hesitating to repeat my mantra. He said, what? You are shy to repeat your mantra to your own guru. Repeat the mantra. So I repeated the mantra. He said, I will give the same mantra to your friend. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> you see? So every day, I mean, every time I would see him, you know, later I, some other began to feel very nervous in his presence. Very nervous. I don't know how it happened, but I began to feel very nervous in his presence. You know, when I first met him, I was very free. I was not nervous at all. But later, maybe I began to realize that he was a great soul. Some or other, all. Oh, you see, I would f say, well, beware your meetings. A great soul. I would see how other senior swamis would uh, behave before him. You see? So I used to feel very nervous. But as I said, sometimes I remember his looks. Every time I went, I'd go into his room. He perhaps never said a word or two. Sometimes he would not say anything. He would just look at me. And the love and affection that I could see in his looks, softness, you know, unless you've experienced it, you do not know. So uh, how I used to feel soothed if he looked at me, if he smiled a little, a flicker of a smile, I wouldn't say. Once in a while, of course, he would be very happy. So it was like this. And on one occasion, I surprised him. When he was alone, standing on the veranda of his building, watching the Ganga, alone in the afternoon, standing alone, bare-bodied, no one about. And I surprised, I went there without knowing that he was there. I looked into his room, he was not there. Then I looked around and found he was watching the Ganga flow by, and he was there. And I went and made my pranam. And then asked him, bless me. Son, I said, bless me. And then he put, placed his hand on my chest and made some remarks, which of course I cannot disclose to you, which I, you know, is not possible for me to disclose to you. But that sustains me very, that, you see, that those words are a source of inspiration to me. I feel highly elated when I remember that I had that good fortune of having him touch me in the chest and say those words. So later when I joined the mission, I noticed certain habits of Mahapurush Maharaj. One habit was every morning he used to feel he was the chief attendant of Sri Ramakrishna chief attendant. So he insisted that every morning the monk who was in charge 
of the kitchen would come and report what things were being prepared for Sri Ramakrishna. So he would come, he would say, today, you know, Mott was rather financially very much handicapped. We grew our own vegetables, could get our vegetables from other places. We had no choice. We offered to Sri Ramakrishna whatever we were able to grow, once in a while maybe something special for Sri Ramakrishna. So the Swami in charge of the kitchen would come and say, Sir, today we have got these vegetables from the garden and I propose, I propose, not that he says we are going to prepare, he would say, I propose that we prepare such and such courses for the Lord. Sri Swami Shivan would listen and sometimes he would say, fine, go ahead, or he might add one or two items. That's all. But I noticed that every day he would insist. Next to him, the doctor Swami would come. There was a Swami who was in charge of the dispensary. That was the time when many monks suffered from malaria. And this doctor Swami would come. He would then say, so and so, is still suffering, but his temperature has come down. The symptoms are also slowly going. He's better. So and so. So everyone, the whole list, he will read out, he will mention. And then he will also offer comments, give him some milk. Oh, it was a rare commodity at Belwood Mott in those days. Only a handful of people could get milk. So he would say, give him some milk, he needs nourishment, and so on. Next to come would be the man who was in charge of the dairy. We had several good cows in the dairy, and each cow had a name of her own. Someone would be called Mongola because she was born on Tuesday, Mongol. So she would be called Mongola. Another would be called Bhagavati, goddess. Another because of her color would be called Kali because she was black, like this. And Sam Shivananda knew each of the cows by name and the monk in charge would narrate how they were getting on, if they had any trouble. On one occasion, I remember, a cow had uh, labor pain, but she was having difficulty being delivered of the calf. So a veterinary surgeon was sent for one of his disciples, but at that time he had not had his initiation. He had started coming. Later he had his initiation, he became a disciple of his. And he came and he relieved the, well he treated the cow and soon there was a cow and everybody was happy because that was one of our best cows. And he came, it was winter, and he reported how everything went and paid his respects to Swami Sivananda. It was winter, and on that day, someone had sent him a very costly shawl, Kashmiri shawl, and he, that was the first time he was wearing it when this veterinary surgeon came and reported that the cow was fine now, was free from danger, he at once removed the shawl from his body and put it round the body of that veterinary surgeon. 
Mahapush Maharaj <coughs> was always fond of dogs. Even as a boy, he used to have dogs sleeping with him. And even later, when he was president of the order, he had dogs. But they did not sleep with him. <laughs> but they were there, and they were treated with great consideration by everybody. And every day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, one dog, especially, Kelo, because black, would come at 4, he would come, he would start barking, he would lift his head, because Mahapush Maras was on the first floor, and he was down below on the ground floor. He would lift his head, he would start barking, 4 o'clock. That is just uh, an indication that he wanted biscuits. So Mahapush Maharaj would start throwing some biscuits at him and he would gobble them up. Sometimes he would also give them shandesh, sweets. I said them because there was another dog also. But Mahapush Maharaj's favorite was that black dog. So shandesh. There was one Swamiji, Swami Omkaran, the senior, and very close to Mahapush Maharaj. He would watch the dog being fed with Shandesh, and he would shout from down below. He would say, well, I hope in my next birth I would be a Kelo, <laughs> so that I could have Shandesh like this. Mahapush Maharaj once came out of his room. Maybe this is incident has been reported, is recorded, is known to you. Came out of his room. He had grown old, he had grown feeble, he had difficult to walk, but he came. Outside his room on the veranda, there was one big picture, a group picture. You see that picture um, in many places, you see it here too. A group picture in which you see Swami Vivekananda sitting in the middle on a bed. Swami Brahmananda, Swami Turiyananda, Swami Trigunatitananda, he's standing with one of his feet on the bed. There is also Swami Sadananda. He came, he saw Swamiji there with folded hands. He said, oh, Swamiji, how much we owe to you? How much humanity owes to you? Like this, you know, went praising Swamiji. Then Swami Brahmananda, oh, you are our Lord's son. Like this, to everyone he bowed and paid his respects. When he came to his own picture, he said, who is this? <laughs> what right has he got? to be here in the midst of these great souls? Why is he here? That is what he said. Again, he was very proud of the fact that Swami Vivekananda had given him the name Mahapurush. He was very proud of this. He was suffering from asthma. So he had to be very strict about his food. His normal food was, his normal as well as favorite food was a kind of jhol, soup with some vegetables, bitter, bitter goods, bitter vegetables. He was a vegetarian, so a jhol. People would say, Mahapurusha's jhol. Absolutely tasteless, watery. No one would care for it, but he loved that kind of jewel and a cup of milk. That was his favorite food. And the doctor said, yes, stay with that. Don't change this food. But one day he said, look, I would like to eat everything that you offer to Sri Ramakrishna. Bring me the whole plate and I will eat everything that you offer to Sri Ramakrishna. I am his servant. 
I ought to know what you are offering to our Lord. I ought to know. Once you know, someone had prepared pan, pan you know, betel for Sri Ramakrishna. And in the betel leaf, there were nuts, betel nuts. But they had not been, uh, you see, they, it, normally they should be cut into small pieces. They should be very soft and small, but they were cut into big pieces. And Mahapush Maharaj, this was reported to him, and he asked for a beetle, and he chewed it, and he said, how can our Lord eat this kind of beetle? What am I living here for? He was old, he was ailing, but he insisted that he should go into the kitchen, I mean, where the beetles were prepared. He said, I must prepare the beetles. How would they know? I have served the Lord. I know how, what kind of beetle he liked best. So he went and he was weeping. He said, I don't blame anybody. You do not know, but I know. And yet I am not teaching you how to prepare beetle for him. This leads me again to another story. You, some of you may have heard the name of Swami Vijayananda. He passed away. He was in Argentina, he passed away. As a brahmachari, he had been assigned the task of preparing beetle. Now once, <coughs> he narrated this himself to us. He had prepared the beetle, but he said, maybe it's not prepared the right way. I must test and be sure that it is prepared the way it should have been prepared. I have to be sure so he ate it first. Now this is something which you never do. You offer, this is made for the Lord, you should not eat it. So this is reported to Mahapush Maharaj. Somebody went and reported, look, this young man has no respect for the Lord. He doesn't know the basic principles of service to the Lord. And he has started eating the beetle, which is supposed to be offered to the Lord first. So remove him from this job. So Mahapush Maharaj sent for Swami Bijayananda. He was not a Swami then. He had just uh, come to Belmont to enter the orders. Mahapush Maharaj said, what did you do? Why and why did you do it? He said, sir, I thought I must check myself and be satisfied that I have prepared the, the beetle with the right kind of materials, everything right. So I had to, wanted to test it and satisfy myself that it was right, prepared right. It's not that I meant any disrespect to the Lord. So he was very satisfied as yes. I said, good, that's a good idea. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so Mahapush Maharaj said, bring me the plate. I want to eat everything. Now this caused an alarm among the attendants. They said, this would be very, very wrong. He is not keeping well. If there is any slight deviation from his usual diets, that would upset him altogether. No, we can't allow him to eat these things. But what to do? So Mahapush Maharaj had a secretary who was a, a person who was not afraid of anybody. So he went to, the plate had been brought, Swami Sivananda was about to start eating. He came, his secretary, own secretary, Swami Gangesha Ananda. Everybody knew he was a, a person who just didn't care 
anybody. Get respect and love, but was not afraid to do what he thought was right. So he said, sir, I am not going to let you eat anything from this plate. What? Who are you to say this? Well, never mind who I am. I am a humble person, but I am not going to allow you to eat anything from this plate. You should not eat. Of course I will eat. I have every right to eat. He said, son, I am going to remove the plate from your table. I'll remove everything from the table. You may curse me. I'll go to hell. I don't mind going to hell. You may curse me or punish me or do anything you like, but I won't let you eat these things. He said, of course I will eat. See what I am doing. You know, he dipped his forefinger into each bowl and put it into his mouth and said, take it away. Then he said, look, have you forgotten that Swami Vivekananda gave me the name Mahapurush, the great soul? Do you think out of greed I wanted to eat these things? Far from it. Am I not the chief attendant of Sri Ramakrishna? Don't you think it is my duty to taste now and then the food that is offered to Sri Ramakrishna to be sure that the right sort of food is being offered to him. That is why I wanted to taste it. So it was like that. Once a thief had entered Belvin Mott and had stolen something, but he was caught red-handed. And the monks began to debate what to do with him. The matter was reported to Swami Shivananda. They said, bring him to me. Swami Shivananda asked him, why did you come to a monastery to steal? You know this is a monastery. We are, ourselves are poor. Why did you come to steal here? What did you expect to get here? That man, a Muslim, said, Sir, I am very poor. I am practically starving. That is why I came to steal. As soon as Swami Shivananda heard this, he said, Oh, poor, starving. Look, give him some money immediately give him some food and give him a new piece of cloth immediately and let him go. And Mahapurush Mara said, look, my child, don't steal. Try to give up stealing and don't please steal. Come here to steal. Don't do it. And that man, very happy, went away. So he was like this, more bush mortars. Next, I will uh, tell you one or two uh, reminiscences. I will narrate my uh, I will tell you about my reminiscences of Swami Akhandananda, who later became president of the order. Swami Akhandananda was a man who loved trees very much. You know, he had set up an orphanage, the first monk to set up an orphanage. Swami Vivekananda was very, very happy. He said, I will send you money. Go on. Now, when he became president, he would not like to come and stay at Belumot. He preferred to stay at the place where he had been serving the people having started an orphanage and a school and a few other projects. And he was very fond of trees. I remember on one occasion, it was summer, very hot. And he was the only man to have a fan in his room. No one else had any fan in their rooms, but he had one. And again and again he was saying, I want to go back to that place, Shargachi, a small village, 
for there was no electricity and no amenities. But the monks would say, Sir, isn't it very hot at your place? And there is no electricity there. And uh, we hear even to get water, you have to go and fetch it from a well. There is one single well there, no running water. He said, look, do you know why I want to go back to that place in this summer? I can hear the trees scolding me. They are saying, oh, you are now a big man. You are president of the Ramakrishna order. So many people waiting on you. But here, we do not get even water, a single drop of water. We are dying, and you living there in great comfort. You see, I was very touched by what he said, with great emotion, great feelings. I can hear their voices, they are scolding me. That is what he said. Once a lady devotee came to him, said, Sir, may I cook a few things for you? He said, Yes. What thing shall I prepare for you? He said, Anything you like, prepare. So one day the lady came with a few things that she had prepared. And Maharaj Swami Akhanan said, All right, I'll eat them. And he ate. Next day again that lady came and asked, Sir, did you eat them? Yes, I ate them. I liked them very much. But what spices did you use in preparing them? She narrated the spices that she had used. Are you sure that was all that you used by way of spices? She said, yes, sir, that is all. There is nothing else that I used. Why, sir, why do you ask that question? Do you think anything was wrong? She said, you are sure to have added another spice, but you are not mentioning it. We pulled her and she said, sir, I am not able to remember having used any other spice besides that. Did you not use the spice of love in preparing this? <laughs> Ah, the old and the lady began to say tears when he said that love makes a lot of difference. Then he said, love makes a lot of difference. So that was the kind of man he was, in a full of humor, like a child, and narrate his experiences. He had traveled by foot all over India, gone into the Himalayas, gone into Tibet, he used to narrate, and he was a great mm, storyteller, had a wonderful memory. Now I will come to Swami Bhikarananda. Now Swami Bhikarananda had been an engineer. He had made, had mm, been, had made Sri Ramakrishna. He and Swami Sarudananda went to the same college. They were college friends. And he came and joined the order. But he preferred to live at Allahabad alone. He was not a trustee, not in any way connected with the administration of the order. When Swami Sivananda died, Swami Akhandananda became president, and the order needed a vice president. So Swami Akhandananda decided to appoint Swami Akhandananda vice president. Swami Bhikkhananda had a great weakness for fountain pets. He had many fountain pets. But if anybody offered him a good fountain pen, he would gladly accept it. So Swami Akhandananda wrote to him. No, first he wrote to him, said, please come and stay at Belumont. We would like to have you as vice president. He said, I am not interested. Leave me alone. 
Then Swami Arkananda wrote to him saying, look, I will give you a good fountain pen, <laughs> if you agree. He wrote back, send me that fountain pen first. <laughs> I will sign the letter of acceptance with that pen. When I get that pen, I will write. And that is what was done. Now, he had some peculiar habits. One, the kind of dress that he had. It might be hot. Allahabad is a place where the temperature goes very high in summer. But he would have sometimes three or four socks and one of them would be even woolen socks. He would have a number of shirts and coats, a cap on his head. He would be like this. And all these, you know, absolutely uh, shapeless, so that people looking at him would say, now, isn't he funny? <laughs> Once children were laughing when they saw him at Allahabad. He said to them, why are you laughing? Do I look like a monkey? <laughs> so he was like that. But the strangest habit he had was that when he had to catch a train, he would arrive at the rail station three hours before the train was scheduled to leave. Invariably did this. And if anybody asked him, sir, why to do this? He said, look, these British machines, don't trust them. <laughs> they can betray you. Funny. Now, when he became president, he had once come to Belur Mott and he wanted to return to Allahabad. Swami Abhayananda, otherwise known as Bharat Maharaj, who was manager then, had arranged his booking, had his seat reserved, had got a good car also for him for his use to travel to the rail station. So he went to Swami Bhikkhananda, he begged, Sir, your train is at such and such time. You usually start very early. You arrive three hours in advance. I suggest on this occasion, you don't start so early. If you leave, well, would not say, it takes only half an hour. Well, your, you have your reservation. We have a good car, a new car for your use. The road is not, uh, there is no uh, much traffic on the road. So I suggest the devotees will come. They want to see you off. They want to pay your respect as you leave because you will be away for several months. So I suggest that you leave later, I say, an hour before the train leaves. He was very reluctant, but then, because Bharat Maharaj began to insist, he said, all right, as you wish. So they started, just one hour, maybe even less than an hour. Now, as they left Belurmot, there was a flat tire. <laughs> well, that is not a very serious matter. That may make a difference of 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so. The tire, a new tire, was fixed. So they started again. To their great surprise, they found there was a big marriage procession, some rich men going to marry, and the last procession, 
band and so on, you know, large position, and there was no way of making any progress. So they were held up, and meanwhile the time was ticking away, and Bharat Maharaj kept looking at the watch again and again, <laughs> and he was perspiring, what will happen? So I began on the most unconcerned was there. They were able to reach this station barely five minutes before the train had left, was due to leave. Since then, no one would interfere with his schedule. Yes, sir, you are free. He was ill at Belur Mount. But he would not take any medicines. His attendants would say, Sir, shall we call a doctor? Oh, no, don't worry, I'm fine. But he had been having temperature every day, and he was becoming weaker and weaker. He would not take any medicine, he would not eat anything either. So Bharat Morris went to him, Sir, please allow us to call a doctor. He said, no, no, don't worry, I'm fine. No, sir, I would like to call a doctor. He said, will you call a good doctor? Yes, of course, I'll call one of the best. Who will you name? Who will be that best doctor? Mm -hmm. Then he mentioned the name of someone who uh, was a British knight and uh, well-known all over the country, based in Calcutta. Oh, you see, he is the best doctor. Yes, sir. You mean there is no one better than he? No, sir, I don't know of anyone better than he. He said, well, you do not know, but I know. <laughs> there is one who is still better than he. Swami Abhayanandas, who is that? <laughs> he is in the temple. He is looking after me, don't worry, leave me alone. He was like that. At Allahabad, he had been seriously ill. Everybody was worried. This was his last illness. The, some of the senior monks went to see him. They asked him to come to Beirut for treatment, he refused. In fact, he refused to see anybody. He would say, please, leave me alone. He would not let anybody enter his room. That was his habit. There was a boy, one young man, he had raised him. He was the only one who was allowed to enter his room. But they went in all this and they, he didn't like it, but they did go in, they begged. He said, no. I am not going to take any medicine, I am all right. And all the time he would keep saying, Cholo ji, Cholo ji, let us go, let us go. He would say, let us go, let us go. As if he was talking to Sri Ramakrishna, he was saying, I am ready, let us go. Why are you delaying? Let us start. He would have a jar of water in his room and nothing else and no one would be permitted to enter the room except that boy he would re-enter that room once in a while so he passed away he had told that boy of course he had grown old i mean he had grown up he was uh, an adult then never to marry he loved him much. If anybody went to him and said, Sir, I would like to take your picture, he would say, Oh, no, not my picture, his picture. He would ask him to take a picture of his serpent. And he would have him dressed like a prince with a turban and everything <laughs> like this. And even now you can see those pictures. When I first went to that place, I found everywhere 
there were pictures of that man. He was our cook then. He had told him not to marry. But when Swami Bhigyananda died, his relations began to visit him often and say, why don't you marry? They thought he had plenty of money. He must have, Swami Bhigyananda must have given him whatever money he had. Maybe he had, but no one knows. But this young man said, oh no, he told me not to marry. But he is gone now. What prevents you from marrying? Why should you not marry? You are not going to be a monk. <coughs> Slowly, his mind began to change and he said, all night, I'll marry. But how can I leave this place? I can't tell the monks that I want to marry. We need not tell them anything. Sleep out one night. <laughs> so one night was fixed and he tried to when everybody had gone to bed, he tried to sleep out. He wanted to go out by the front door. As he approached the door, he found Swami Bhikkhananda sitting there in his big chair. When he saw this, he got frightened. How is he? How is it that he is here? But he again and again he looked. Swami Bhikkhananda was there. He moved away. Then he thought, might be, I could sleep out by the back door. <laughs> Went there, again he found, he was sitting there. He said, what is the matter? How can this happen? So he was very nervous, went back to his room and spent a sleepless night. Next day his relations came, what is the matter? We waited outside, you never came. <laughs> but he said, this is what had happened. Nonsense. That man is gone. And you see him, you imagine. Never. Come tonight. Be sure that you come. He said, all right, I'll try. Again, the same thing happened. This happened for three nights in succession. And that was the end of it. He never tried again. And to the last day, he sought the monks. Swami Bhigyan had told him, Sat, you must stay here. Never marry. Don't go back home. And he reached that and died. He's a nice man, that man. I knew him. Well, there are so many such stories. Swami Shubodhananda is another man I knew very well. Briefly, I think I have taken a long time. I should close now. He used to visit Bangladesh. Now Bangladesh, it was East Bengal then, Dhaka. Once a year he would go there. And he had to go by steamer, part of the way he had to go by launch, by boat, steamboat. And the people who accompanied him would make out a good, comfortable bed for him. And he would sit there and the devotees would surround him. One day a college, once a college student was watching everything and he was laughing. He came forward and said, if I receive this kind of attention, well then I am prepared to be a monk. Swami Shubhodananda overheard the remark. He said, come on, come here. At first the young man was not silent. Yes. So he came, he said, please sit here. So he sat on the bed. Other people never did that, but he sat on the bed. Then slowly he took his hand and then said, look, I promise that I will serve you. I will see that you receive the same amount of attention as I am receiving, if not more. Come and be a monk. Now, at first, that young man said, oh, I was, I didn't mean it, I was joking. <laughs> but Swami said, but I mean it. I mean it, you can't live here. You have to be a monk. And he won't let him go. Held him firmly. And then that young man apologized and said, please, let me go. Swami Vivekananda <coughs> once asked all his brother disciples to 
practice public speaking. He asked each one to speak. Some were very reluctant, but some were willing. We can't say no to Swami Vivekananda. The last man to speak was Swami Shubodhananda. He got up to speak. He had hardly begun when an earthquake started, <laughs> a real earthquake. And Swami Vivekananda said, what a speech, magnificent speech, Swami Shubhudananda had made. It was an earth-shaking <laughs> speech. You see, Swami Shubhudananda's name was Koka. So every now and then he would say, I am a Koka, what do I know if somebody, some devotees went to him, asked him anything. Any philosophical question, a religious question, he said, I am a Koka, what do I know? I don't know anything. But he was also very well versed in some of the scriptures, in the Puranas, for instance, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and the Puranas, very well versed and very intelligent, highly connected. I used to see him, he was suffering with tuberculosis, Never mind, alone, no complaint, always smiling and happy. And I have met also Swami Abhidhananda. I have met uh, M. Master Mahasaya, I have met Ramlal Mahara, Ramlalda, Sri Ramakrishna's nephew, the other nephew, Shivaram. I have seen Radhu, oh, Regal. She was majestic, walking along the street, majestic like this. You know, she, she also suffered from tuberculosis, TB. She was taken to Banaras. She was dying. So people thought, let her die there. So the monk who had taken her there said, Radhu, stay here. It's a holy place. You'll go to heaven if you die here. Said, what? I have to die in Banaras to go to heaven. Have I not lived with the mother of the universe? Have I not enjoyed her love and affection? To go to heaven, I have to die here. I will go back to Jadambati and I will die there, and go to heaven. <laughs> That's what she says, very spirited. And I have seen her too. I miss seeing Swami Sharadananda. Although I have a feeling that I have seen him, but I can't be sure of, because I once saw someone very like him in a railway station. I had been visiting Bellwood Mount when he was there, but as I said, I had been spoiled by some of the senior monks. They told me, we will take you to Swami Sharadananda someday. And I was waiting for that, but then he fell ill and died. So I never saw him. I cannot claim I saw him. But I can also claim that I have seen mother. I have a feeling that I have seen her. But it is all imagination. It is just imagination. Because it so happens that as a boy, I used to bathe in the ghat at Bagbajar, where mother used to bathe. And some of us boys, who are, say, eight-year-old, Ten year old like that. Some of us would go together, we would swim, splash water. But if mother was there, I remember this scene. Some elderly people will warn us, they point to her. I have an impression someone bathing there, a lady, surrounded by three or four other ladies, and all people leaving the water, 
till she finished her bathing i have that impression but it might be somebody else or it may be it's just imagination but i love to think that it is not imagination it is true that it was she that was taking her bath so that's all i'm very glad to have been able to share with you these memories great great memories as i look back even the smallest incidents appear to have such a deep meaning i will i just remind you of another incident one night after supper the monks had all gathered under on the veranda below swami shivananda's room and they were laughing and shouting you know sometimes they behave like school children our monks senior monks pulling each at each other's leg you know they sometimes would compose doggerels to you know to for fun at other monks so they were laughing shouting very happy sam shivananda was above that baranda and he was hearing them, their voices do you know what he did with folded hands he said mother he used to call sri ram krishna mother you probably know that and lost his mother very young so right from the first day he met him when he first met him he placed his head on his lap and began to weep and ram krishna began to treat him as if he was his child motherly affection so from shivananda would always refer to him as mother so with folded hands he said mother these boys have left home and heart they have left behind their parents and their close relations they have come to you for joy to be happy to enjoy this life the life of bliss mother protect them make them happy see that they are not disappointed having come to you you see that is what he said so mahapurush maharaj was like that thank you